My name is Markus Heinzer. I'm the executive director of Franciscans International here in Geneva, Switzerland. As you know, Franciscans International is representing you, the Franciscan family, at the United Nations, working together with many of our sisters and brothers from around the globe for the protection of human dignity and our Mother Earth. With this event, we would like to share with you about our activities around business and human rights, and also facility, facilitate a conversation with you in the context and spirit of Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Now I'm happy to hand over to Moema Miranda. Moema is secular Franciscan and one of the coordinators of the Inter-Franciscan Service for Justice, Peace and Ecology in Brazil. Moema, thank you. Good morning, peace and all good. Friends, sisters, brothers, it's really amazing. It's a big honor and it's a great pleasure to be together in this particular and so hard moment uh, of our work. Uh, as Pope Francis has said in his last encyclical, very strong shadows all around our world, but even deeper hope is raising. So at this moment, it's quite important that this, is, this initiative of Franciscans International can connect us, can allow us to give voice to the initiatives that we are connected to, and can give more clarity to Franciscans that are acting in their, the grassroots levels, understanding the links between their particular activities and the family as a whole. Franciscans International, as Marcos already said, has an action that is quite important in the UN level, but it cannot act alone. It acts from the perspective of the Franciscans that are engaged in the local areas, in the grassroots movements, defending land, defending the rights of the earth, defending water, and defending people as ones. As we know since Laudato Si, but that has been in our tradition for a long, long time, the destiny of earth and the destiny of the sons and daughters of earth are one and the same, are connected. And at this moment are the poor, are the poorest, the most vulnerable ones. And as Pope Francis has said, among the poor, earth today is mainly the more damaged, the more uh, under really big risk. And that involves all of us and each of us as well. So it's quite important to reinforce the links, the net, the connections. And for that, it's quite important for us that are working in the grassroots levels to know how Franciscans International is acting and how we can connect. And it's quite important as well that we can raise our voice in the United Nations as Franciscans International demanding and putting uh, uh, from the perspective of Laudato Si, um, the, the most important and the more deep responsibilities of business in guaranteeing human rights, because many violations, as we all have seen, came many times from the big companies. So all those issues will be around our table today or around our small <laughs> set here today. And we have people that have been engaged since a long time in this conversation. So it's my pleasure to be here with Marcos, with Budi, with Rodrigo, with Sheila, with Angelito, and with Ben, because together we want to engage in this conversation and to raise different perspectives, different voices from different countries as well. So we'll be from Brazil, from Nairobi, from the Philippines, from Rome, from the United States, from Geneva, so Franciscans, men and women, 
from the, all our family engaged and trying to build through the perspective of Laudato Si a better world for all of us. So with no more time uh, of all this speech, I will ask each of our uh, speakers to introduce her or his self to explain a little bit from which perspective is approaching, speaking and making uh, his contribution. And we will start with Sister Sheila that will help us to understand the historical background on Franciscan engagement on mining advocacy. So from that perspective, Sister Sheila, very much welcome. It's a great pleasure. You have 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Naomi, for that introduction. I am the executive co-secretary of the JPIC Commission for the two unions of men and women religious here in Rome. And when I was involved in the Integrity of Creation Working Group, that was in 2009, we looked at many environmental issues. But I like to say that starting in 2011, we became quite intent on the mining issue. And so I'd like to begin to share my screen and um, also uh, go through with that kind of a historical background, which many of you um, share in. Am I ready to go? I had it. Uh, okay. Um, now you can see all of it going backwards here. So however this happened, it, it started the wrong way. Okay, so this is um, our task. I'm also involved in the JPIC and mining network. So we continue to move in, in ways that we hope make a difference. So this all got started back in 2011 when our religious leaders were out visiting our places uh, uh, where we have ministries. And so many said, please do something about mining. This is, a, this is devastating our countries. And so with that, it came to the JPIC promoters in Rome. And in 2012, in January, we decided just to send out a notice and find out indeed how true would this be. And we found that that 75 re responses said, please do something. We carried that initiative over with the Rio plus 20 meeting, which were about 63 Franciscans gathered there. And that we decided to make that a priority. The mining was a priority and that we would collaborate with the Integrity of Creation Working Group in Rome, as well as Roman six, which were the leaders of the, of the different uh, uh, congregations, Roman uh, Franciscan congregations in terms of JPIC. So shortly after that meeting, right away, Franciscans International, Amanda Lyons gets on and has something about mining and the approach and following up then not only with that meeting as well. But in during this time, we were conducting a survey in which 250 completed this survey, which was in four different languages. It was an effort on our part to really try to find out what was happening at the grassroots. And in the same process, we also involved the dicastria, at dicastria but at that time was the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, because they found out this was an issue that was also at their doorstep and can we work together? So what did we get from that survey, which has been very, very helpful? What was happening with the different religious congregations and church groups? What were the working relationships that were happening amongst the advocates? And a whole list of different kinds of contexts that would serve our needs going forward. And description really about the activity taking place where there were mining companies really involved in, in destroying the in environment areas there. A number of articles were written as a result of that, and that database continues to be operative when we work out and we look at what can be done with mining. So shortly after that, I realized that that news was out in September 11th, 2013, we have the meeting then a day of rec uh, reflection with CEOs in mining. I, of course, was a part of that. Also, Joe Rosansky was not at this meeting, but had helped plan the way of really interconnecting uh, with those CEOs and sharing in a way that did not violate confidentiality the results of that survey that I just spoke about in March to get them know what it is that we know about 
what's going on. And uh, that was an important uh, meeting, but there was really no commitment coming from the CEOs from that uh, session. So when we, I shared this with the CEOs, again, we did not violate confidentiality. We had the question that they asked, why weren't there any mining companies involved in this survey? And it was clear that we did not include them because we did not want to skew the data. We really wanted to be clear about what was happening at the grassroots and have that be organized. So that was an important um, contribution of, uh, for us to be able to make that stand uh, before that group. Uh, so in accompanying this uh, a survey that we've done and then results that we continue to publish and do PowerPoints, we had a document called the See, Judge and Act Reflection on the Impacts of Mining. So it was a way of pulling in then Laudato C because this was happening then closely in 2015. And so we had the data on Catholic data that was scientifically acceptable, Catholic social teaching and really promoting solidarity and that we need to be about the common good when we relate to areas regarding mining. Shortly after that, we realized that to be credible, we needed to have a professional organization analyze the data that we had collected. And so with that, we had the Isadic group from uh, Barcelona, Spain, who took the data that we had collected from all of our respondents. And we received a positive evaluative comment from the survey that we did. And the dicastery really considered this information as groundbreaking because it pulled together important information that was serviceable for our work going forward. And the major directive that came from that survey analysis from the Barcelona Business School was that we needed to engage in networking, that we had to get to the grassroots and find out really what was going on. And for that, we had asked a brother Rodrigo to be the person then to carry it forward and make the connections necessary for us to have the networking possibilities on a global scale, a reality. And this was backed, of course, by Franciscans International and other groups as well, because we were seeing the global connections are important. And then Rodrigo continued to keep uh, us informed about what was going on. So it was an ongoing process that we could see the development and we could have input in terms of where the directions was, were going and provide him with the uh, kind of support that was necessary for this very difficult job. And day one, right after he got the assignment, Rodrigo goes out and makes all the, a number of connections in Rome, with FAL, also the UN uh, Food and Agricultural Group here in, in Rome, Ray Palm, real, he went immediately to the social forum in Tunisia and contacted again, re, uh, emphasizing to the Pontifical Council of the nature of the work that Rodrigo has been asked to do in the name of uh, this survey going forward. So shortly after that, there was a movement in terms of a need to really listen now to the, all, those affected by mining. So in July in, uh, of that year, we had 30 representatives from the 18 different countries and participants from different Episcopal conferences, religious congregations and organizations. And you can see we're pulling in here now, Caritas and Sidsi. So there's something really unique about Franciscans International is that we want to involve other key players. It's about collaboration and really, really working together. So for that group then, as Franciscans International brought forward the, the leadership, they included then the mining working group, the churches in mining, and also other uh, uh, advocacy channels through the United Nations. So I was asked then as part of the leadership team with working with the dicastery or the Pontifical Council at that time to conduct a survey to kind of find out what, was, what were some of the needs and interests of those who were participants in this, in this session. So basic information in terms of what they were representing, how they interface with the government and the church and the expectations that these uh, participants had in this meeting. And when I presented it, it was a way of giving them a, a sense of who was there, a kind of a feeling of bonding that they could then begin to relate to one another because what they were going to say was important to the group. 
So we had different speakers coming here, Paulo speaking and, and addressing the, the gathering there uh, for that uh, uh, group for alternate, those affected by mining, as well as Bar, uh, Barrio, uh, Dario talking about the environmental destruction, the contamination that was taking place, the uprootedness from the territories, the loss of their economy, uh, common strategies that have already been put together. And then it, and that's in this group, then uh, really putting together an open letter to the Pontifical Council coming from the participants themselves, asking them to address certain issues. So you can see we have engaged in a very interactive format in a way that wants to bring together those people that matter in terms of the mining. So shortly after that meeting in the summer, we have another meeting with the CEOs gathered um, at the um, Vatican regarding the information from the survey. So I presented the information to this group of, of leaders in the mining industry, but I did not violate any confidentiality and let them know what we knew about the situations and also how we are organizing ourselves to try to work together. Following that, then we have some time in between with Laudato Si and the, and the Sustainable Development Goals and the, pu the, mush, the push from the UN Mining Group to really deal with uh, SDG 6, which dealt with water sanitation. And then a follow-up for us to deal with reflections on water we had, you see us meeting with some of the members of the mining group in uh, um, New York. So we, what we, we are able to do is kind of interface with one another, offering the C, the judge and the act, the C and the act coming from the, my, the working group uh, at the UN and the judging, the discerning, the spirituality uh, component being coming then from the, the JPIC persons here in Rome. And Rodrigo has an article in this uh, booklet on reflections on water. He was asked to speak about the indigenous population. So for these years, Rodrigo in his networking, Reebok working in the DRC area, those different countries there, other firming up the different uh, networking groups that you celebrated then the thematic social forum in at South Africa in 2018. And Moody, of course, had a lot to do with this as well. So all of that work since he was networking brought in fruition for this meeting here in South Africa. Every voice was heard and disrespected. Not you could do everything about it, but we knew the issues that need to be addressed and that we needed clarity and united voice around this UN binding treaty that we wanted to have addressed to the uh, international corporations. Here we see a demonstration that took place outside the local area. The local people were not involved for their own safety, but those who were outside were able to come and participate and show support for the needs of the local community regarding mining. And I have to say that some of the feedback that I'm getting on the voice to say no about mining is encouraging the mining companies to really look at the expectations that they have given to com uh, communities where they want to do mining and begin to say how they need to be accountable for the things that they say that they are doing. So having a voice such as this has caused an accountability factor that is so necessary for the mining uh, companies as well as what's happening on the local, local levels. So come in May of 2019, for the first time ever, now the human development, the Castri promoting integral human development, gathered in one room, the CEOs of mining companies, those affected by mining, the church leaders and related organizations. And you see here Rodrigo being one of the ones coming and sharing about those affected by mining and bringing a young man from uh, Bromadina. And here we also had a meeting with Pope Francis and he was able to receive then all of these uh, pictures of those who had died because of that Roma, that disaster. And have to say that that really let us realize the consequences of behavior when, when uh, the mining companies do not take seriously enough the consequences of their actions. So there was an openness with Pope Francis in receiving these photos. So then following that session in September, 2019, this was a meeting on JPIC and mining. 
supported by Franciscans International and all the people that are present for this meeting, except for my only, were very much present and giving input for this meeting that we had in September. So we were working on issues related to thematic social form, as well as how could we influence the Synod on the Amazon coming forward and being involved in the Casa Comun. So here you see the assembly meeting there, again, bringing those pictures from Romadinha, bringing them into their spirit, helping us move forward in ways that make a difference for the disastrous effects of happening with, with mining. And this also clearly we became a network going forward and Rodrigo then also is the coordinator of the JPIC and mining group. We had re representatives active involved in mining from around the globe present for this meeting. And as a result of that session, we were able to put together a statement on mining that was in several different languages. It was written in the spirit of Laudato Si, calling attention to the violence of mining in the countries and human rights abuses. And here you can see uh, how this was posted then on the website for all of those who were participants in that synod to have a chance to uh, read the document in their language. That was so important. And we know that mining appeared in that document. And we also know recently the Pope continues to speak about mining as a concern for him. Then in the Casa Comun, we had a sharing of what took place in the JPIC and mining seminar. And we had an, an indigenous leader, uh, Furman Chimanti Taohi, the indigenous leader from Peru, who spoke about the disastrous effects of mining. He related particularly to the illegal mining and, and gold. But again, he was saying the mining is a serious concern for his people and for all of us. Following that, then in February, we have a meeting that we brought together the, the bishop from Romadinha speaking in terms of the disastrous effects that continue to not be met in that country. This is uh, Bishop Ferreria. He's a redemptorist bishop. He was on a webinar that we had both in English and in Spanish, really updating us on the concerns that he had for his own country and how we can be supportive of him in these efforts. So his heartfelt story was shown here and then he met also at the UN, and he, which was supported by Francis. We now give the floor to Franciscans International. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. We welcome the report by the special reporter. We agree that protecting the environment contributed to the fulfillment of human rights and to safeguard our common home. Although Brazil has been listed in your report as an example of good practice, communities are usually not consulted when granting license for mega projects, or these licenses are given without following the procedure in the law. We call the government of Brazil to ratify the ESCASU agreement and provide enough information, consultation, the participation of the communities and civil society in the process of licensing of mega projects, particularly of mining companies. The breaches of tailing them in Brumadinho and Mariana continue producing harmful effects and nothing has been done to prevent similar events. In Minas Gerais state, at least 40 dams are in danger of collapsing. To realize the right to a safe, clean, health, and sustainable environment in Brazil, the government must comply with its international obligations, preventing the guarantee that companies are held accountable and fight impunity to avoid criminal disaster. Mr. Vice President, thank you. Thank you. And so with that kind of an impetus, we are continuing to fight for the UN binding treaty for human rights on transnational corporations in whatever way we can be of support. And that we continue to bring the message of mining to the COVID-19 Vatican Commission, uh, writing on mining, bringing the issue, showing videos and all of that. So the issue continues to be a, a priority for us here in Rome as we work together with you, carrying forward the important message of the 
the UN binding treaty on human rights. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sister Sheila. I think that from this big overview, we can, we could understand the, the deep connections and the importance of having the action in the ground and the possibility of intervening as well in different spheres where all this is moving in a direction in, in another. I forgot in the beginning to say that we will have in between our, our expositions some time for answers and questions. It will not be possible for us to open the floor to the participants, but uh, we really ask you to please share your doubts or your comments or your questions in the QA or in the chat so that we can take them in account uh, when we, we pass through the next round. So thank you very much, Sister Sheila. It has been a great work done. And the famous Rodrigo that some, so many times has been mentioned is here and we can listen from him. Um, and then uh, we, we will listen from Angel Cortes um, from the Philippines. So each of you have 10 minutes. I'm trying to control the time, but I ask you as well to do the job for yourself. So Rodrigo, you are starting now. It's 10.29. So 10 minutes from now on, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be talking here. And uh, I think after the explanation of Sister Sheila, uh, I will be concentrating more on, on the issues and on the struggles that we are dealing. Uh, as you know, Brazil is the second largest producer of mineral wars in the world. And there is an unlimited expansion of extraction that we live in here. The resistance of communities and territories directly affected by mining ventures has been intensified. However, the policy of responsible appropriation of, of what is called uh, natural resources and which in fact are common goods of humanity and nature itself has been reinforced. Uh, I, I, I want to highlight at the end of my talk uh, something that I think is extremely important with, when we're talking about uh, business and human rights uh, and, and the discussions for the binding treaty, but it's also the role of the governments. As you know, mining sectors always disregards the populations of the territories in which they are based and always acts criminally towards uh, people and the environment, not only in the case like criminal uh, tailing dams break like in 2015 uh, in Mariana when killed 20 people and destroyed a river basin of the, of the river Doce in Brazil, the fifth river basin of Brazil uh, and, and killed 20 people and around 3 million people affected, but also uh, the, this was done by Valley Company and the Australian, Anglo-Australian BHP Billington, but also uh, in, the, uh, in another big case, which was happening and was mentioned here, Brumadinho were killed 272 people and destroyed another river base. So mining companies, and negatively, they reconfigure the territories where their ventures take place, destroying the diversity the diversification of local and regional economies, generating what is called mining dependence, degradating also working conditions in mines with high accident rates. So the logic of profits govern mining sector and is subject to the financial system. We, we should go a lot, with a lot of examples about this, but let's go, let's go on. Along with human rights violations perpetrated by transnational mining corporations are the government states in partnership of a continuing violation of rights and destroying the environment. When a company arrives in a region, the state see it as a partner in development. Mm -hmm. And from that moment, it is the state that defends the entire licensing process of the enterprise, configuring another form of corporate capture when not reaching corruption in the various cases around the world, but not only here in Brazil. 
the mining, the mining extractive sector dominates state institutions. The series of corporations, neglects, bureaucracies, and disregard for human rights and environment are no exception, but characteristics of mining model, which are reinforced by impunity as a result of corporate capture of the state. This capture happens through electoral campaign financing or through the so-called revolving door, which is a movement of high level employees from public sector jobs to private sector jobs and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Revolving door strategy directly influences process of licensing of projects and also dominating the territories. To see this architecture of partnership between transnational mining corporations and governments, I want to highlight what's happening right now. On September 3rd, this year, the European Commission published an action plan which changes its raw materials policies. The plan focuses directly on common goods or the so-called natural resources, such as minerals, encourage the implantation of mining projects in Europe country, in European countries, and also in, in the Global South. Presented this, uh, the European Commission presented this as a response to climate crisis. It wants to guarantee raw materials. What this is what they say. This is to meet the demand for new technologies said to be sustainable, necessary for the European Union to make its green and digital transition. On September 13, the European Commission, pursuing the, its economic interests, launched an industrial alliance. They already had launched, launched but battery alliance with the industries of battery regarding to the issues of lithium. And the objective, and now there's a huge alliance of, of, of transnational corporations, of course. And the objective of this alliance is to provide, as they say, strategic autonomy in the so-called critical materials, such as rare earth. And it's interesting to see the race is open. A few days ago, the United States and Brazil created what they call critical minerals task force to develop mines and refining techniques to supply so-called rare earth necessary for national security. And this information came from the US Department of State. They released this in a press conference. This task force aimed to support the advancement of bilateral diplomatic commit commitments and technical cooperation in relation what, with what they call, like it's called in, um, in Euro Euro Europe, critical minerals, including improving the safety of these critical minerals in the United States and in Brazil, promoting economically viable, viable mining and production flows, stimulation of investments, driving technological innovation, and increasing the interconnectivity in between the United States and Brazil through supply chains of critical materials various sectors of civil societies are demonstrating and talking and saying that insisting that it's necessary to realign these concepts of development with the needs of the planet and humanity. However, companies and governments take a green rhetoric, speak of the need to meet the goals for sustainable development as advocated by the UN. But in reality, what is happening is that they want to feed the enormous appetite of the European Union, of the United States to res for resources. The problem, the challenge here must be solved by reducing and reusing materials before recycling. This is some groups are saying. However, there's no binding commitment to take action to reduce the overall consumption of resources, change the ways and, and lifestyle, but rather a policy of security, sovereignty, and market protection. Uh, so what we, what we see, despite uh, these criminal actions, human rights violations in the fields, uh, 
tremendous predatory way of doing mining, the so-called uh, system continues, you know, and uh, and what we see is that what is being um, uh, a request from from uh, the environmental movement, which is hundred percent green uh, energy and everything, is being used now on the search for these critical min minerals like lithium, co cobalt, niodium, um, titanium, and others. So this is going to this is going to pro this is going to cause more conflicts in the fields. This is this is uh, are going to cause more uh, uh, environmental environmental impacts. So we have a huge challenge here. And, and I would end my talk saying that it's, it's, it's necessary to interconnect our experience. We, we are having very interesting experiences of victories in terms of areas with no mining, uh, the right to say no. We just had the case of Pascualama and the south of, of, of Chile, where they were able through the law to stop mining. We have the case of suspension in Peru, in the region of Kahamak and Conga, we have the big uh, issue of the, the victory in El Salvador, where there is a law, it's the first country that banned metal mining, all regarding to the issue of water and to preserve water. And now here, we are on a big campaign, starting a big campaign, two big campaigns, and I finish. The Churches and Mining Network uh, that uh, we are trying to start a campaign of investment on mining. We need to reflect, especially religious life, church, where our money is and who we, we are supporting. And the second campaign that we will start is the right to say no. We need to struggle for territories free from mining. The right of the communities to say which kind of environment and which kind of place they live and which kind of development they want. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rodrigo. It has been great to, to hear Rodrigo after Sister Sheila, because then it's becoming clear and clear and clear the action of the mining companies in the fields, in the grassroots areas, in the community levels, and how important it is for us to have a real legal binding instrument that could call and appeal and reinforce the, the, the commitment of the big companies with human rights. They will not do that just by their own, just because they are good people, <laughs> not even just because they are converted. So the action need to be from every side. So from the grassroots level, as Rodrigo has said, but in all the, the experience that Rodrigo brought to us, the whole of church has been crucial. So the commitment of a church that really takes it responsibility as Laudato Si asked us to do is quite important. And it's very good to, to see and to have the Franciscans as part of that. So I invite you all again to put your questions, observations or, 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 or comments on the QOA. And we will now hand uh, over to Angel Cortes from the Philippines. And I ask you please to introduce yourself and you have 10 minutes. Now is 10.41 in my time. Please go ahead. Greetings of peace and all good to everybody. I am uh, Angel Cortez. Uh, I'm the current executive secretary of the Association of Major Superiors here in the Philippines and the national coordinator for JPIC commission here in the Philippines. And I also work in the JPIC commission of our province in East Asia and member of the commission in the general area. Well, I, I will really begin my sharing uh, with what is happening in our country nowadays. It was eight years ago when we experienced Haiyan and two days ago, we are devastated by Typhoon Goni. And I want to begin my sharing with some clips of what had happened here in the Philippines for you to really see.
So I will not really finish the clip because it's too long. But I wanted to begin my sharing, bringing what is the reality in the Philippines right now. We experienced three consecutive typhoons in this week. And we are really badly heated. And in fact, I just arrived roaming around to evacuation centers because I remember I have commitment with Franciscan International and I have to speak and bring the message of my people to everybody and to ask for international solidarity. But the pictures that I've showed are concrete realities of what is happening in our country. We have 44 active mining sites in the Philippines and it was closed during the COVID. But apparently this month, the government reopened 39 from the 44 mining uh, operations. We have 29 coal-fired power plants. And this is what is destroying our land. I believe that people in the periphery, especially in the provinces, cannot really speak about their experiences. But the companies, the businessmen, the foreign companies that is coming here that promised money and profit are really deceiving our people that they are really contributing to our economy. But in reality, they are the one destroying our ancestral land and you know, destroying all those areas that we should really preserve, especially those, our refuge that can protect us from typhoons. I was a seminarian when we experienced Haiyan and thousands of people really died. Now that I am a priest working for justice and peace, experiencing these catastrophic calamities. In fact, in this year, we experienced volcanic eruption, not to mention the COVID crisis. We had uh, 10 typhoons around and then uh, earthquakes. I don't know how our people will survive from those calamities that we are experiencing. But I believe that the main cause of these natural calamities are the disrespect and the irresponsibility of those businessmen that are deceiving our people, promising economy and money. The irresponsibility of our government, not to pursue laws that are protecting our people and our environment, but for their own good. We organize a lot of noto mining and a lot of movements here in the Philippines and people are really now awake of what is happening. But even the people are really there hand in hand together. I think we should really pursue a much larger scale of solidarity and that's why I'm taking this opportunity to bring the message to my brothers and sisters from other country because happening to the Philippines can happen to other vulnerable countries, not only in Asia, in Africa, but in the whole world. Those people who cannot speak for, their, for themselves. And I am really thankful to Franciscan International for always giving me the opportunity to bring the voice of the voiceless especially our human rights issues. But you know, here in the Philippines, it's really interconnected. Our government is killing not only because of corruption or because of uh, the president's remark, but even in money, even in business. That's why I believe in this cause that we really need to talk openly in the light of Laudato Si, that as church people, we can really do something to really encourage those people in the peripheries. And lastly, I believe what the Pope said during the time that he called those uh, people in the business, that what, what is really at stake here is our dignity, the dignity of the poor, the dignity of those people who are victimized, the dignity of people who are defending the environment, and the dignity of the indigenous people that are defenseless. And lastly, I want to share a short clip of our campaign that uh, promotes uh, the relationship between business and uh, mining.
because uh, in these times, we should really make the people understand that uh, there is really a big relations with, with this. So I will just finish my sharing with, with this clip. It's a 30 second. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's in Niyanig naman ang magnitude 4.7 na lindol ang Cebu kanina kumakapas sa inyo nga halos sa wala na tayong makita. Binaha ang ilang bahagi ng Aurora. So the campaign said mining can cause devastation. Mining can destroy our ancestral domain. And mining can really cause a lot of calamities and devastation. So I think that's it. I am thankful for this opportunity. Please help us in this point of time. And we value, we value your solidarity with us, the Filipinos, even though we are resilient. But we also need your solidarity. Thank you and may God bless us all. Thank you very, very much, Fray Angelito, here from Latin America, where in Honduras we, we had the same kind of situation last week. We are all in deep solidarity with the Philippine people. And we know that, that what is happening all around is not just natural as it used to be. It's completely connected with a human way of acting through Earth, in Earth, with disregard, as you said, to respect of all creation. So that is what we are deeply committed. That is what we are deeply working to each and every day. And it's quite important, as you said, Fray Angelito, to know that when we are facing those struggles with people in the ground that are people that are supporting as well in a biggest network, because it's a systemic question, as Rodrigo said, and as Sister Sheila uh, exposed. It's not one plus one. It's a systemic way of acting. And we need, of, of course, to overcome it, to act uh, systemically. Now I invite them in that understanding, uh, Budi, to, to talk to us. Would you work at the Franciscans International UN, uh, uh, the Franciscans International Office? And he will talk to us about the Franciscans work at UN, focus on the legal binding instrument um, and how it can be connected with our struggles. I again invite you to share questions or observations through the QEA. Budi, dear, please introduce yourself and you as well have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Moema. Dear brothers and sisters, uh, my name is Budi Changyono. I work as the program coordinator for the Asia Pacific in Franciscan International. I am Indonesian by nationality, and it's a real pleasure for me to be able to uh, provide the information on what we are doing as Franciscans at the United Nations regarding the issue of the impact of business on human rights. So, as Franciscan voice at the United Nations, Franciscan International has worked to promote the respect of uh, the respect for human rights in all business operations, in particular in the extractive sector, as it was mentioned by Rodrigo, uh, Sister Sheila, and Brother Angelito. So working with uh, closely with the Franciscans and the grassroots communities, we are trying to call for greater accountability for corporate abuses, including access to justice for uh, the victims. We believe that uh, the 2015 uh, Papal Encyclical Laudato Si has provided guidance in bringing the voice of the affected communities to the attention of the international community, in particular, the United Nations. We want the voice of the affected communities amplified against destructive mining and other forms of, of extractivism, but we will not replace them to speak for themselves we will always respect the rights of people to self-determination. We also cherish and acknowledge the diversity of spiritual sources of indigenous communities and our respectful companions of the grassroots communities. 
knowing that violence can be brought against us and the communities we serve. So we promote and pursue nonviolent actions and resistance. As Franciscans, today more than ever, we have the opportunity to think about a possible new world. In this context, we believe that the teaching of the papal encyclicals uh, as in particular Laudato Si, but also now we have the new encyclic uh, Fratelli Tutti that can offer a more human and fraternal framework for thinking about an integral and more just development for the human race. And consists of this deep roots, Franciscan International decided to engage at the United Nations to ensure that economic development does not go against the respect of human rights Situations where people are forced to work in human conditions, indigenous people are displaced from their biodiversity rich traditional lands by destructive mining operations and uh, village groundwater is depleted by beverage corporation are still too commonplace and structural change then is needed to make a difference. The idea of creating an international legally binding instrument, sometimes we call it as treaty, that's the same terminology, that will curb the worst of, the, of these excesses by holding corporation legally accountable if they commit human rights abuses. And this has been, uh, goes back at least in the 1990s, even before when the international community is trying to put uh, the company, the corporates accountable. However, these efforts that have been done for uh, de uh, decades have so far only resulted in of voluntary guidelines and pledges that have been proven inadequate to protect the victims or to ensure access to justice. So in uh, this regard, a significant step to change was taken place in 2015 when the UN Human Rights Council created a mandate to elaborate a treaty that will govern the activities on trans transnational cooperations. Since this year, since 2014, FI has taken a leading role among different civil society organizations, as well as faith-based organizations, supporting the efforts of the United Nations to establish a legally binding instrument that would regulate business activities in uh, international human rights law. Franciscan International has set uh, out to actively engage in the sessions by providing inputs, commentary, and analysis together with other civil society partners. Our aim is to ensure that any future international agreement will address the gaps and obstacles that victims of human rights abuses face. The UN Working Group that is uh, officially called as Open-Ended Intergovernmental Working Group on Transnational Cooperation and Other Business Enterprises with Respect to Human Rights, this is a very long term at the United Nations, sorry for that technical term, often we refer it as ITWG on the NC. So, so far, there has been six sessions that take place between July 2015 until the last one that took place in October 2020, a few weeks ago. So just to give you a little bit of a glimpse on what happened in those sessions, on those discussions. In the first three sessions, the discussion essentially were around the broad issues and element that should be included in the future binding instrument. And the fourth session, uh, the discussion started with the zero trough that was proposed by the state, by uh, uh, Ecuador at the time. Uh, as well as on the so-called optional protocol. And then in 2019, last year, uh, we had the first draft that was, the first draft of the legal binding instrument that was uh, as a source of the discussion. And then this year, we elaborate again the, the second draft that was based on the inputs coming from uh, last year. So it uh, took place October, a few weeks ago. So in the current draft of the, uh, this legally binding instrument or treaty contains several key provisions that would pro prove instrumental in the strengthening the position of victims of human rights abuses. Rapid globalization has brought on a new level of anonymity to business transactions and operations. With production chains stretching across continents, the right and avenues to of redress for victims are often murky at best. The treaty would change this by establishing clear rules for courts to provide remedies even across borders and involving several states. However, it would do more than just that. Recognizing the vulnerable positions of victims, the draft treaty imposes 
an obligation on authorities to investigate and protect them and their families from intimidation and retaliation. To mitigate practical barriers while seeking justice, such as lack of uh, money, uh, the draft includes provision for financial support for victims seeking justice and other help to overcome obstacles to accessing justice. So the draft treaty uh, also requires companies to report on non-financial matters, including the environmental and human rights uh, impact of their activities. So the treaty and indeed the negotiation itself have proven controversial. Some economically powerful countries, homes of many world's largest companies have attempted to water down the text, claiming it would hurt global development. However, if I will remain faithful to speak on behalf of the affected communities by amplifying the concerns of the Franciscans through Franciscans and partners through legal contributions to the, uh, to the draft and ensure that the future treaty will address the gaps and obstacles so that victims of human rights uh, will uh, receive their justice. In its engagement of this process, Franciscan International has been listening to the experience of the Franciscans and its partners who are directly affected by the business activities. Just to give you some examples, in 2016, for example, FI invited some partners, which include uh, Mr. Henry Muhia from the Episcopal Conference of Natural Resources in the DR Democratic Republic of Congo, Mr. Jaibi Garganera from the Philippines, uh, representing Alian Satikilmena, Pablo Sanchez from Gruvides, whom uh, we saw in the picture, as well as uh, Friar Rodrigo uh, Perret that came also. And then in 2018, it was very important for us that we organized a parallel uh, event, a conference within the UN during the negotiation, in which we invited some key figures that in, from the Catholic Church that included the Cardinal Alfaro Ramazzini from Guatemala and Monsignor Andre Duvite, Bishop of Rui Barbados Barbosa Diocese in Brazil, to speak to the United Nations, to speak to the delegates on the importance of the future treaty. I'll just give you two quotations from them. Cardinal Ramatini said that companies have become like half gods that are managing the lives of people. You might think that I'm exaggerating, but in the case of Guatemala, I'm not. Therefore, the experience has shown that guiding principles need to be complemented by strict laws, meaning the legally binding instrument. In the same tone, Monsignor Duvite from Brazil said, we need to be part of these discussions because our work rests on two pillars. One is the catechesis, but we must also strive to create an equal and just society in the service of life. The example of Pope Francis has made it clear that the church stands with the people who are vulnerable and at risk. And then he continues, in a divided society where the powerful, uh, in this case, the corporations can stream roll the poor and then we support them, we support the poor. In 2020, in the last uh, negotiations, if, if I have made several contributions during the negotiations, uh, especially on the, issue, on the key issues such as the better definitions and clarification of the international human rights covered by the treaty, liability, due diligence, access to remedy, as well as the provisions of uh, concerning civil and criminal liability if I will remain engaged in the process in the coming years, because it's still a long way to go, to go but we, are, we would like to ensure you that we will continue to listen to the Franciscan Senate's partners, to the people, so that our contributions to this process should be meaningful by the end of the day to the victims. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Budi. Thank you very much. I think you put it very properly. So the work of Franciscans International in the UN level is not delinked from what Frey Angelito, Frey Rodrigo, Sister Sheila are working in the ground. It's, it is all connected and that is the biggest importance. And at the same time, we are not in the middle between communities and the companies. We are with the communities. That is quite important, Franciscans, even if we are in Geneva, here in Brazil, in the Philippines, we positionate ourselves with the church, with communities. And in that regard, we receive here 
um, important questions that I will share with you um, uh, to see who would like us to, 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 to answer. Um, from Goose Garcia, we have, how are minors being supported by the Franciscans International? From Anne, we receive a very, very important uh, question that I share with you. I agree with everything I have heard. However, our problem is that sometimes some people have made all their livelihood by mining. They are workers. Huh? The, uh, to even mention to them devastating to, to the devastating to those people who are who have no other pl place to get to work is quite difficult so how do we give people hope with talking taking them away from the the means of supporting of their families so how is it that we can uh, really engage with the people that is directly involved in the mine worker is quite important and i i I think it's one important uh, question for all of us. So we have just 10 minutes for these uh, reflections. I think um, uh, it's opened the floor for all of you. Rodrigo, uh, sister and uh, brother Angelito, sister Sheila, or even Marcos and Budi, two minutes. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Put your mic on, your mic, please. Sorry. I completely yeah. go ahead. This is a challenge. And I think in order to address, uh, we need to see, of course, the systemic causes of this crisis. We have to come to a collective understanding of what the causes are and what the people are facing. Because when we see, and, 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 and I think it's the first, is how to engage mining workers and communities that are dependent from, from the system uh, of, the, of the mining sectors when they establish in the territories. They create a, what we call mining de dependence and sacrifice areas where everything can happen despite of the impacts because this is producing uh, the richness. But the richness that is taken from, from the ground is not the region that remain in the ground. Uh, I think despite the considerable efforts in many countries, the rates of death injury and disease among the mining workers used to see the reports from the ILO remain high and the mining remains the most hazardous occupation when the numbers of people are exposed. But I can give one example, which is very, two examples and I finished that are very interesting. Now with the pandemic, what's happening in the mining areas? Are the small farmers, the family farmers that are bringing food to the, to, the, to, the, to the outskirts of the cities that where the mining workers are and where the poverty is and bringing food. So I think this is extremely interesting to, to, to understand. That is life beyond mining. But we had a very interesting experience that happened here in the south of my state where the bauxite uh, industry is trying to implement a, a business in the area. What we did with the community it's what we call a social mapping of the area. We tried with the support of university to point with the GPS of even on, on the map, all the resources that exist on the ground. Of course, the bauxite site were there. It's huge. It's overcome all kinds of the richness that come from, from, from the fields. But when the people saw there's a farm here, the, here we, we are supporting. Here we get money from this from, from this activity. And there, there's a richness that is blinded by, by the co but And then what's going to happen with mining? All this will be destroyed. And what's going to happen after? So people got strengthened to fight for the goodness. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I don't know if Sister Sheila or Angelito wants to say a word before we go through in our program to ban. Uh, I just want to say that we have to look at transitions. You know, if we want to have, uh, that we just don't have ideas that we're going to be against mining if we don't deal with the local areas in terms of what would be the economy to rejuvenate that place, as well as the cleanup. You know, who's paying for the cleanup that's going to take place? So these are, we need to be having these conversations in order to make a viable future. So thank you very much, Sister Sheila. Brother Angelito. 
I think what is really important is uh, to make these people realize that mining is not the only option. Giving them sustainable livelihood programs that can support their family and to to give them capacity building for their skills in order for them to realize that there are options, not only mining. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bodhi? Very briefly, because uh, we are talking a little bit about the uh, the treaty and how the treaty should, the future treaty should function. Uh, I think uh, what we are trying to do is really to make uh, the state also accountable in the sense that the treaty will be addressed to the state because it is the responsibility of the states not to regulate the mining, the business corporations, etc. So the state should be responsible because the state has the mandate from the people, from the miners, from the victims. So the state should be able to address this issue. This is their responsibility. So from that perspective, the treaty is designed or we are trying to push uh, the, the, the treaty that will make the states accountable because they are the, uh, uh, the duty holder. Thank you very much, Budi. I think all those are important aspects because the, the, in the end of the day, it looks as if the companies are poor companies that cannot be accountable for their human rights uh, uh, treatment. So the question is that in the end of the day, we can, we can say, oh, poor company, you don't have enough profit, so we need to protect your private interests. So it's quite important for us to put them on. We are at this stage thinking about transition, we are not saying let's close all the mines today, even if we want to do it as a process, but at it is, they need to be accountable to the human right laws, to the environmental laws and to the labor laws, because as it has been asked, the workers in the mines, they need as well to be protected in their uh, rights as workers and uh, human rights and as communities that are um, uh, connected to the mines. So thank you very much for these very interesting questions. We have some more questions that we will come back after um, uh, giving the floor to Ben. It's the biggest pleasure to have Ben here. Um, he's at Nairobi now, but we have been working for a long time together and seeing how connect and connections between Latin America, the Philippines in, in Asia and Ben uh, in Nairobi, how everything is really connected. Ben will help us to, to connect all the discussions that we are having here, all the questions that we have been raising with Laudato Si, that gave us the, big, uh, the biggest uh, framework for our um, uh, daily life work. So Ben, you have 10 minutes starting from 11 and 11 in, at my uh, watch. Go ahead, please. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Moema, uh, Pache Ben, everyone, and Brother Benedict Ayodi, as Moema said, I'm a Capuchin Franciscan and living in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, currently uh, working as the outreach officer for the Franciscans International. And I'm humbled to, uh, to make this presentation uh, on the responsibility of business on human rights in the context of Lauda to see. I think we must agree that uh, we, we Franciscans, we are very privileged to have two encyclicals of the Pope actually pointing to our history and our culture and our values as Franciscans. Um, in Laudato Si, Pope Francis challenges us with the question with, that is very important indeed, what kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up and it reminds us that environmental protection cannot be assured solely on the basis of financial calculation of costs and benefits in Laudato Si number 160. The environment is one of those goods that cannot be adequately safeguarded or promoted by market forces, he says. And, and even again, uh, he points to the same kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, remarks uh, in Fratelli Tutti, the new encyclical, his third encyclical, uh, that calls more human fraternity and solidarity and is a plea to reject actually wars and conflict. Um, he speaks pretty much on, um, you know, achieving a world, we, achieving the world, we must have an open heart. We need to experience social friendship, seek what is morally good, 
and practice a social ethic because we know uh, we are part of universal fraternity. We are called to solidarity, encounter, and graciousness to create an open world with an open heart. It is necessary to engage indeed in politics and advocacy, what I think the Franciscans International are doing. And he says, a, a better kind of politics, so not just any politics, is essential. It is politics with social charity that seeks human dignity, knowing how to dialogue is the way to open the world and build social friendship. Just again, going back more, basing more on, uh, on Laudato Si, uh, Laudato Si emphasizes the social shared purpose of God's gift, arguing that the world is a gift which we have freely received and must share with others such that Solidarity is not optional, but is rather a basic uh, question of justice. He speaks about this in uh, Laudato Si 159. As such, all creation is a gift from God, arising from God's loving plan for his creation. These gifts include the gifts of natural environment, the gift of our very selves who are creatures and thus parts of nature, but are also spiritual and thus able to, tra uh, to transcend nature and the gift of our relationship to all of creation, with other persons, and especially with God, our creator. So since everything is a gift from God and inherently you know, social, the Catholic social teaching argues that business corporations have a social purpose, such that those who control and honor corporations have a duty towards others and the natural environment. This includes the mining companies, indeed, as, as Sister Sheila mentioned. Louder to see once again is unjust situation where corporations impose negative extra externalities on the natural and social environment and care only about increasing productivity and profit, but do not bring about an, in, in, an integrally higher quality of life. Such social responsibility means that business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth and improving our world. This teaching that business corporations have a social purpose does not negate the rights to private ownership of, corporation, of corporations, which is strongly defended in the Catholic social teaching, but imposes limits on the just use of such ownership, such that the benefits are shared rather than only accrue to those who own or control the corporation. So uh, according to the Laudato Si, human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with, with, with the earth itself in Laudato Si number 66, where the main problem is that each of these three uh, vital relationships have been broken. Due to the intertwined nature of these relationships, Pope Francis argues that each of these three broken relationships need to be healed simultaneously. They demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, uh, protecting nature. So because everything is connected, business can only achieve their social purpose through the just cooperation with all stakeholders. Lauda to see emphasizes the critical importance of social capital, the network of relationships of trust, uh, dependability, and respect for rules, all, all, for rules, all of which are indispensable for any uh, form of civil coexistence in uh, Lauda to see number 128. So I argue that corporations create value through the creation of shared goods with social, economic, and environmental value. And so Pope Francis writes that it is, it is we human beings above all who need to change, arguing that the ecological crisis is also a, a, a summons to profound interior conversion. And the personal response required of each of us in turn requires that each person has the necessary freedom opportunity and help from others in order to develop one's ability to respond to each person's full potential. Accordingly, the Catholic social teaching 
It teaches that the practice of business should be characterized by subsidiarity, which is based on the centrality of genuine human freedom. Practicing subsidiarity means that each person has room for personal initiative and creativity and receives help from others to develop their particular skills and moral character. So in conclusion, we need to ask what is the purpose, priority and practice of business for corporate social responsibility? First, we have a personal responsibility to respect others and our natural environment. Thus, our personal responsibility cannot be separated from our social responsibility. In other words, our duties towards others are not just up to us, because in the understanding of Laudato Si, everything is a gift from God. As such, corporate social responsibility does entails a duty to ensure that the corporate strategy and the co cooperation with all stakeholders contribute to human and environmental flourishing in line with God's uh, original gift. And uh, second, corporate social responsibility requires that a certain priority in, is given to solidarity and preferential option for the poorest of our brothers and sisters, Laudato Si number 158, whom Laudato Si notes are particularly vulnerable to environmental, social, economic, and political degradation, as Brother Angel told us in, in the Philippines. So th this is required in order to ensure justice as those who have benefited from a high degree of industrialization have a greater responsibility for providing a solution to the problems they have indeed caused themselves. And this we see even in, in Laudato Si number 170. And finally, uh, the most practical consequences for corporate social responsibility beyond ensuring that any pollution or negative environmental impact is minimized is to create a corporate environment that practices subsidiarity towards integral human development and social inclusion. This means that those in position of authority with superior power, those who own corporations like mining, mining companies, inform and control have a responsibility to serve others, not only just one's own immediate interests as he says in Laudato Si, number 122. So in particular, Pope Francis argues that the current model with its emphasis on success and self-reliance does not appear to favor an investment in effort to help the slow, the weak, or the less talented find opportunities in life. So finally, Laudato Si challenges all of us to allow God and others to help us to change first and foremost ourselves to grow in virtue, but personally and socially in relationship with others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. It has been beautiful to see after all the challenges, the roots of, of hope, because this is the combination that is needed to have very clear understanding and analysis of the problems at the same time, finding ways out. Otherwise, we just uh, support the same no future that the companies want us to believe. We are uh, with very short time. We thought we would have 15 minutes. Now we have less than that. But we'll try, in any case, to engage with some of the important questions that came to us through the participants uh, in this last uh, uh, time. Our aim now is to try to respond how to engage as Franciscans with this issue. Uh, what, is the main, what is the main takeaways and how we can act more deeply. Of course, uh, you are all invited to be linked with Franciscans International. We have many campaigns, share information, but still, what can we do more and deeply than that? And there we have some interesting questions and observations that I will not be able to read them all, but I will like to start with this from Stella Matutina, beautiful name. She says that business, you know that uh, I have just seen it right now while listening to the speakers that in the center of business is not profit, but seeing. So that's quite important in the center 
of business is seen and how we address that. We had important questions from Sandra, from Eanon, um, on, on how to engage and, and to go deeply on that. How can we go uh, to be altered, uh, to take in, in consideration the common good and not only profit? Um, since we are dealing with companies which engage with much more money, uh, asked to us Stephen, uh, to defend their interests, how can we as Franciscans get as well enough resources to be more effective in our, uh, uh, in our work? as he uh, understood, understands that it's, everything is connected and we have a system, not just small um, actions. Um, we have Sandra as well asking us, how can we uh, be more effective in our, in our work to engage all these, these, these um, communities and effort? And as well, how can we protect the ones that are most and more vulnerable uh, on the actions of the enterprise. We know that the dangerous, the dangerous uh, with human or um, uh, human right defenders are growing in all our countries. So this comes together with the actions of this connection between the enterprise, uh, the companies and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the and governments. That's why the, the global and the, and the binding treaty can help us in our work. So I will give the floor to each of you. Uh, think very well because many questions and two minutes to each to try to address them all. You can choose, you can read in the QA the questions that have been shared with us and you can pick and choose the one you think you are most uh, 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 proper to answer. Trying to move in this sense. How can we engage more as Franciscan, how can we go deeper in our work, how the, the people that are listening to us can as well be engaged in, in this conversation. So I will start from the one that want. So please, each of you will have two minutes. So who wants to come first? If anyone, I will ask Sister Sheila. I think one of the interesting things that came out of the meeting that we had at the Castry with all the three groups, the mining companies, those affected by mining, the church groups and organizations, that there were some things that were actually said, uh, one of them being by one company that in 10 years there would be no tailings for their, um, from their mining areas. So we had other, and we had at that meeting, someone who's been watching that particular company. So I think it behooves us at these meetings when things are said that we just don't let them be said, that we follow up on that. And there's some things that I would like to follow up and see where we're going because it's not just enough to talk about things. And in that meeting, we also talked about, wow, well, can you build trust? And one of the ones also said, you know, ask the people what they want and then follow through with it before you take your money for your profit. So some of these things we need to be able to say, where are we out now with that? That's what I say. Thank you very much, Sister Sheila. Next, Rodrigo, nice. as I think you. Oh, oh, Ben, Ben will come first. Okay, Ben. Okay, because because Stella, I cannot see Ben, so. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, yes. So Stella is uh, is pointing to something very very important, saying that uh, some of this business and the uh, the cruel actions behind them, especially especially with mining, uh, she points to the question of sin, which is then a moral aspect that also you know the points at in in Laudato Si and even in Fratelli Tutti, uh, that points to greed when people are greedy and uh, they they put profit before people, that is that indeed is sin because you you then do not care of anyone else, you care about yourself and uh, just uh, you know gratifying your ego, and I will support you, Stella, that that. That is that, it, that you could point to that particular aspect uh, of, of morality. And so we need a lot of confessions there. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you, Ben. And just to remind you that during the Amazon Synod, one of the most important aspects that have been raised is exactly the ecological theme. 
So how to think about that and to take it in account. And I remember the bishop that made that proposition. He said, uh, when I'm uh, listening to confessions, I have lots of moral, sexual things, but I have never listened anybody's coming and saying uh, I'm guilty because I deforestate or I'm guilty because I polluted the river. So how to take it in account deeply in the sense of uh, a moral as well as a principal uh, um, aspect of our actions. Uh, Rodrigo, please. Well, thank you very much. I would say that uh, I think in Laudato Si, Pope Francis is talking about that love is also civic and political. And I think that's the first thing is we have to know and be clear which side we are. So we are with the communities, we are with the poor and from there. When we had the discussion with Cardinal Tuxen and the Dicastery in 2015 with 30 affected uh, people from mining uh, business, she's a shale from all around, all around the world. The, the request we did, the, 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 they did was, we want the JPIC, and now we can see, we can say we want a dicastery to talk to the bishops and to, within the church that they need to support in the ground. So I think we as JPIC people from the different branches of the Franciscan family, we have a commitment. I think the, the first commitment is on the ground and support those who are, and that's why the, the idea of the, the survey identify people is extremely important to connect with the people's organizations and movements around. We have all this uh, issue of the thematic social forum and Franciscan International and other groups Franciscans are involved, but also to start to work together with Franciscans International more and more because let's say the role of Franciscan International is a specific within the UN system and advocacy for us, but we need to bring the issues. We need to bring the challenges to Franciscan International and together work and as response to, to be more, I, I don't like this, to be more active in the places where are uh, from the perspective of Francis and Clay. Thank you, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Uh, Angelito, can you come now? Yeah, uh, I would like to answer to that question that, uh, yeah, this kind of advocacy and work is really challenging. When you speak about the truth, people will go against you. And what I experienced when I started to work with FI and be in the United Nations is, you know, having breakfast with death threats and people will give you bad comments and it's like a, a part of your daily routine. And I believe that as religious and church people, we're playing a big role because this is not about us. It's about the story of the people that we are working with, their struggles, that we are journeying with them. And I believe Rodrigo is right, that in order for us to be successful with this advocacy, we really need to be rooted in the ground because sometimes we're also tempted with motivations that drive us to, to our personal motivations. But again, in the end, it is the story of the people. The people will win, it is not us. And when the people win, it is also our victory in the victory of our advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Angelito, very beautiful. And of course, uh, as everything is linked, uh, it's not one by one, but is as Pope Francis has said, as we build community and as Franciscan, building community to be together and even to help each other in the moments we, in which it is very difficult for us to, to stay. So as you said in the beginning, pray with me, pray for me, this capacity of praying together is quite important and to act together is even more important, but it just can come from our deep committed commitment with people and uh, with our faith. So I hand now to Budi before giving back to Marcus to finalize. Budi, do you want two minutes please to help us answering the questions? Thank you, Emma. I think what we learned very uh, clearly from Lauda Dossi as well as from Fratelli Tutti is the fact that we have the hope. The hope is with us. We have the hope, we have the power. 
So I think it's quite important to be empowered by these uh, two encyclicals to say that, okay, uh, we are not, we do not want to be co-opted by the current system. We do not want to be co-opted by the way of uh, dominations proposed by the companies. No, we have the right to say, no, it's enough. The power is with us. We have the hope, we have the good examples. When Rodrigo mentioned about the fact that uh, some uh, uh, mining companies have been revoked in several places, I think this is a hope that people can say, no, I create my own uh, future, I create my own hope because I believe that I have the power. Uh, another example is from uh, uh, the Philippines, and we've, we've been working on this of Tampakan mining, in which I think Father Angel has been part of that, and Franciscans, but also other things. Now we have new hope that it is still possible to say no to this mining companies. And even if we look at the involvement of Franciscan at the Franciscan international, at the international level, it is also our expression to say, no, we don't agree with the system. We would like to have more just system in which the people are at the center. So I think it's good to retake again the power so that we can say that we have the hope and we have good examples. Thank you very much, Pudi. And I think that in that sense, Pope Francis helped us a lot in Laudato Si because he connected as well our personal commitment with our communitarian uh, commitment, with our political commit commitment, and with our international commitment, as well as with our commitment with God. So these links, uh, these deep links, are quite important. And I, I really do think, as for after this long road that we already are uh, uh, at that this stage, that we from the church, and particularly with we Franciscans, that the faith. The connection among us is quite important to keep us there and not to give up uh, because the struggle is not easy and we are not saying that it is easy, right? But we are committed to deep and we are committed to follow. So it has been really a great pleasure to be together with you, uh, to all the audience. Now, uh, it, I think it was important as well for us to put it as a process. It's not one moment one action, but it's a, a very beautiful building and we are learning together. In the very beginning, we knew less than we know today. And this process of knowing, of seeing from different perspective has ingrained very much Franciscans International to be part of a biggest uh, coalition, not acting alone. So Franciscans International has been very important in pushing and, and promoting connections uh, and links uh, with the, the climate um, struggles as well. We had a question on that, that none of you had answered. So I will give the floor to Marcos because he will finish uh, our, uh, our conversation. And I will ask Marcos to as well say two minutes about the links between the struggle uh, on the Biden uh, uh, Treaty and the climate issue that is in the core because as we have been seen from the Philippines, but as well from all our countries, those natural disasters are not natural at all. They are part of our thing, if we want to, to use that language. So Marcos, thank you very much to this opportunity for putting us together, for uh, allowing us to be in touch today. And uh, I give you the last two words and please, say two words about the climate issue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Moima. So before I close with three words, I give just quickly the floor to uh, Woody. He will answer to the climate. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, thank you, um, Moima. In fact, many of us are involved directly uh, with the issue of climate because we can't escape from this climate uh, uh, issue because what's happening uh, in the world now is precisely uh, the core problem that we all have to address, that we understand the uh, changes in our climate uh, uh, cycle, it's not natural, it is the human being. It is uh, part of the uh, man-made disasters. And I think it is quite important to say that the legally binding instrument in which we are trying to uh, build together, it also has a very strong uh, elements on the responsibility of the corporates, the business corporations in terms of natural or environmental destructions. That's why the uh, impact assessments, not only from the human rights perspective, but also from the environmental perspective is crucial. So this legally binding treaty will be 
one of the elements, apart from many other uh, uh, instruments such as the Paris Agreement, so that the actions from one uh, mechanism to another mechanism is not done in silos, but it is complementary. So it's a common system that has to be built together to make sure that Mother Earth is taken care of, that Laudato Si is embedded in all these uh, climate actions, at least from our perspective. So it is quite important to uh, say again that this legally binding treaty will also address not only the issue of human rights, but also the, the issue of the uh, impact caused by the business operations on the environment. Yeah, so I'll give it back to Marcus now. Thank you, Budi. Um, three words. First, um, I just would like to remind us that this webinar was initiated by Franciscans International, but together with the so-called Laudato Si revolution initiated by the JPIC office in Rome. And you may know this website. And this campaign of the Laudato Si revolution has as objective to mobilize all of us as Franciscans to take action at the place where we live. And it would be dangerous if we would see now all the actions that we do as Franciscans are at the international level, at the UN or in Rome, or just for activists in different countries. It is up to all of us, every one of us can contribute to a change by, as Rodrigo said, first to change the perspective. How do we approach and see things? And I think in whatever um, function or life situation we are as Franciscans, we can be part of this revolution of the change, no matter if it is as a priest in a church or as a sister in a hospital or wherever, to start with a change of our own um, lifestyle, um, which is not just a question of us case, but really of social justice and of the protection of the environment. My second word is just a word of thanks. Thank you to all the, of the participants, the speakers. It was really very, very rich, the conversation. And I hope that all of you um, experienced it as inspiring for your own life and activities. And a very special thanks also to Moema. Um, she again uh, really moderated this whole session in a wonderful way with her great spirit and love. Um, it was really um, great and it was a long session, but thanks to your moderation, it was a lively and a interesting um, session. And the third word is let's keep in touch. And for this, um, after the webinar, after you close, um, Please whether subscribe to our newsletter on the website um, or go to Facebook and connect with us. Um, and the other is also um, you will receive a questionnaire and we would be very grateful if you could complete a questionnaire and submit it to us. It's anonymous. So don't be afraid, but it would help us also for the follow up. So thanks again to all of you, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you.